Hello all, it's John Atkinson again here doing another interview for the Circumcision Harms docu-series. And today I have Kira with me. Kira, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got here. Hi, I'm Kira. Um, I'm a mom in Florida. Um, I've been an intactivist for almost six years now, um, ever since I found out that I was pregnant with my son. Um, so now I'm here trying to fight for other kids' rights because I've always believed in my sons and I think that that's, you know, I think that's a right everyone should have. So here I am. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for joining us today. Okay. So I have a list of major topics that I try to cover on this. So there's so many different ways that these genital cutting rituals in the world affect uh, not just the people that are getting cut, but everyone else too. Right. Okay. So um, the first part I'm going to go over is the physical aspects of uh, how males are cut. Uh, I don't delve too much into the how um, females or intersex uh, cutting harms them physically. For, when it comes to males, or when it comes to females, everyone's heard at least the worst kind, the worst form of FGM, right? Because mm -hmm. it's been blasted across um, the mainstream media, and it continues to be blasted a lot. In fact, today happens to be the um, zero tolerance for FGM day <laughs> of the year. <laughs> so it's getting a lot of attention today on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to cover the physical aspects that uh, how men are affected by male circumcision or male prepucial amputations, or some call it male genital mutilation or MGM. Uh, to help raise awareness about how men are hurt. And then I'm going to cover how that affects the partnerships sexually, um, heterosexual, intersex, and, and anal sex. Um, and then I'll get into the psychological effects. Uh, again, not just on, about how it affects the uh, individual that are cut, but <clears throat> everyone else too. Yeah. And then I delve into the relationships, how it affects relationships. It kind of overlaps a little bit with the psychological relationships, but it's another it's another um, issue to look at. And then I'll get into how it interrelates with FGM and intersex genital cutting practices or intersex normalization surgeries. And uh, and then the very last thing is social productivity. Okay, so on the physical aspects of the male, I have this little tool that I like to use to kind of show people how the male, the, the normal male anatomy is supposed to work, right? Mm -hmm. And the first word I'd like to cover is acropostion. Uh, John Geisker from Doctors of Public Circumcision actually did a presentation. Like, it's on my YouTube uh, channel for anyone to look at, but he shows an image of a statue of a man that was intact. And he had, uh, you know, you could tell he's, all of his skin is there and he even have some skin hanging off the very end, right? Probably about a centimeter. And that's what is referred to as the acroprostion. And supposedly, uh, like before like 130 something AD, that's all they were removing. It's just that little bit. But today, um, <clears throat> they remove everything or they lay bare the glands. G L A N S, for anyone that doesn't know how to spell it, I see some people should call it glands with a D. It's glands, it's the it's a dark colored part. The fireman's hat, as John Geschke put it, um, part of the penis, right? Uh, the part that's you know kind of like you know penis is in the United States and Israel and uh, in a lot of Muslim countries typically look like this. They don't have the propuse covering it. So and now there was a, a couple of scientific studies done to prove this. I don't know why you can just ask a bunch of intact men this, but this is sensitive skin. It's not dead. It's not vestigial. It's not like hair, fingernails, it's living, highly innervated, highly vascularized part of the body. 
I mean, if you look at intact penises, you can often see the blood veins going up through it. And like if it's all pulled back, it continues all the way up the penis. So when you're cutting that out, you're affecting the blood flow to the penis. And uh, and yeah, it's definitely sensitive skin. Uh, Sorrel study and Basio study both identified that it's sensitive in multiple ways. It's sensitive to light touch, the Meisner's corpuscles. It's sensitive to heat. How about that? Hmm. Took a rocket scientist to figure that one out. <laughs> um, and even the AAP identified themselves in the early 70s. This is this is here to protect the glands. Uh, it's still there to protect the glands. It's kind of like, you know, your lips and cheeks are there to protect, you know, your teeth and your tongue and all that and keep everything moist inside like it's supposed to be. So as I'm going through this, if there's anything that you have that you want to add to it, um, when, I, when I'm pausing or whatever, feel free to chime in. I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on it. So a lot of people say, total neck and they're, they're trying to be you know nasty about it or whatever it's like i don't want to put in total neck whatever the fact is it's that's a very good representation of how the penis actually works all right i mean yeah. imagine cutting the skin off of the turtle's neck that would be horrible no one would be able to extend his neck out properly right well same thing with the penis it's shrinks very small and gets very big <laughs> right there's it's a big change in how it works and if you cut off the prep use then you don't have a whole lot of skin to work with down here and for a lot of men including myself that ends up being too tight which causes a lot of other problems which i'm going to go over here mm -hmm. um so and because it uh, a lot of people compare this to like eyelids, right? You got one side that's skin, and the other side of it is mucosal. Helps keep your eyes moist and protected. Same thing with the, with the prep use. You've got the mucosal side, and you've got the outer side. But th this is what makes it a little bit more interesting, um, which I would refer to as the rolling, rolling mechanism. Is it's actually a fold of tissue. It's going up and then back down and getting and attaching the below the, the glands, right? And when the penis gets larger, it it rolls down onto the shaft, right? Different men have different amounts of it. So sometimes they end up looking like this when they have an erection and some still have some coverage. But um, any good mechanic uh, that understands bearings and all that, understands that, you know, that's kind of a, a rolling bearing of sorts and uh and since this is mucosal on the inside it's moist it's lubricated you the male gets to bring lubrication to the cane right yeah it's absolutely. not it's not uh, a dried out stick <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> Give me a second. yeah unfortunately um in my personal experience, I find that more often than not, um, being an American woman, it is extremely harsh on a woman trying to be sexually active with what we have out there right now. Um, fortunately, um, I've been with both and I know the difference, mm -hmm. but you, you can't go back from that once you know, and you're absolutely yeah. right. There's absolutely no lubrication for a circumcised man like they are it's like a shot in the dark with them <laughs> they have no idea what it's like yeah whoever did this to us men uh, they should be paying for all of our ky jolly uh, purchases <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and then uh, there's this part called the frenulum and uh this actually has a little part on here that kind of represents that these little lines here right it's uh kind of like the part underneath your tongue it's also referred to as a frenulum it goes up and down um my oldest son actually had a tongue tie when he was born so his his frenulum was too tight and i was holding his tongue back and when he stuck his tongue out it kind of was like a fork and he couldn't breastfeed right mm -hmm. when he was first born got fixed very next day 
but uh, and then he went right to breastfeeding with no problem but um and there's a term for it for um for the male penis too it's called um uh, for, uh, brevet brevet for being short abbreviated <laughs> So, uh, according to the Sorrel study, that's a very, very sensitive area, right? Mm -hmm. So, depending on the kind of cut that's done, that's affected um, to varying degrees, right? So, mm -hmm. in order to keep the prepuce from trying to pull back up over top of the glands, I do have to snip it this way, right? Kind of like you'd have, like my son had to have his snipped so his tongue would release properly. So they had to, you know, step it so it, you know, stays down. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> there's different tools and different methods that different butchers use. Um, I believe that I was cut with a, a Mogan clamp, where they pull the. You can actually watch this if you want to look up uh, the Zosa tribe and how they do it outside, outside and all that. But yeah. gross you out. But <laughs> you know, they, I don't they, think I can stomach it. <laughs> they pull up and 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 then they, you know, snap this way. Right? They'll maybe they'll you know take a clamp on or the Jewish barzel just slides on and they just slice with a knife but the Mogan clamp is designed to close and then be um, held closed for a certain period of time so things can coagulate and you don't you have less blood the, the thing about that though is it ends up leaving the intermucosal area right thus more uh, in my case more of my finger area is still here so compared to a lot of guys I've spoken with, I'm lucky. <sighs> but then there's your eyes that were cut with like a plastic bell or a gomco clamp where they stick a bell over the top of the glands. And it's in some ways it's ideal because it helps protect the glands. And this probably was born out of the fact that there were too many cases where the glands gets cut or snipped or clamped or, or, completely amputated or whatever, right? Uh, in fact, the Morgan Clamp business was sued out of business because of all these problems that occurred. And what's crazy is that they've been using the same clamp over in Africa, uh, you know, up until recently. I don't know how they didn't, you know, see that it was a bad idea, but. <laughs> um, so when you're, clamp, when you're cut with a bell like this, you end up, Getting cut just below the 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 glands, and you can look at enough penises, and you can you can see there's a different you know you see two two colors of skin. Mm -hmm. You can tell where the the inner mucosal area is and the and the shaft skin, right? Mm -hmm. And if they have less inner mucosa, chances are they were cut with the belt. Not the yeah. Thus, more of their frenular area was removed, so they have. I mean, this is like, according to the sorrel study, look at it. This is like the super sensitive, super hot spot. Right? Yeah. And even myself, I'm 50 now. I didn't start learning about this until I was 35 when my first son was born. And um, I didn't pay any, I didn't pay that kind of close of attention to what's going on. Right. I mean, just, I, I didn't, it didn't dawn on me to even think about it. Um, but now I realize, yeah, that's, that's, that's the spot that really gets going right before orgasm. Yeah. So it's important. And I've heard of men that they get actually, you know, some butcher or whatever goes underneath there and actually free hands it all out, cars it all out. So there's no premium at all. Yeah. I've heard of that as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, some men that have that issue say they can't get to orgasm at all. So, um, yeah, <clears throat> really makes me sick when I <laughs> hear those cases, but, uh, yeah. Okay. And then the last piece is the ridged band. And this is often compared to like your lips, right? You got the part going from the intermucosal out to meeting the, the skin, um, the outer skin and same thing on, yeah, this is typically closed off. This doesn't isn't a really good representation because it's not elastic enough there. Um, the prep use actually kind of has a a musculature built into it that makes that squeeze down. And when you look at a baby penis, you can tell it's it's like closed off, really tight, where it's 
meant to be a one-way sphincter. So it allows stuff out, but nothing in. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to sex and all that, when that starts rolling down and spreading open, opening up over the glands, spreading out, um, it, according to intact men that I've heard from, one, the most popular one I know of is Michael Winnell from Forced Skin Revolution. Uh, they talk about how just that process of the ridge band spreading out is a sensation in its own. Right? Mm -hmm. Sensation that guys like me will probably never ever get to experience. And even, even I think even re restoring guys don't quite, they don't get the ridge band back, they don't get the nerves back. Um, I, they've, some of them said that, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of, you know, tightening there after they do some restoration, but I just don't imagine it's the same. Yeah. So let me get another drink. So the, all this not having the prep use leads to a lot of issues. One of the first ones, um, is the, um, hairy shaft. And uh, you know, if you look at this, and this is the bottom of the penis, and this is the top of the penis, you know, it's going to the stomach, and this is going down to the, the scrotum. The, when the penis starts going out from the body, it brings the scrotum with it because there's not a whole lot of skin. You, know, there's not, you don't have the prep use done roll down on the penis, so it's pointing the scrotum up with it. And that means you got scrotum skin on the shaft of the penis, which is typically hairy. I've seen some pictures like on Circumcision Harm where um, all the way around it's like hair is being drawn out onto the shaft of the penis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's referred to as scrotal webbing. Uh, there's some pictures out there. Uh, if you look up scrotal webbing, you can like I've seen pictures where the scrotum is all the way up just underneath, underneath the, the glands. So to me, that's a that's a serious botch. <laughs> yes, I agree. And because inside of the scrotum, you have the testes, men's balls, um, that's also being drawn up. And I've seen images, uh, videos, even porn videos, um, where the, the testes are being drawn up to the sides of the shaft of the penis. So it's not very comfortable. Um, no. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, and that can cause a little bit of squeezing on the testes. As you know, men don't like getting kicked in the nuts. Um, for me, it, and one other person that I've interviewed so far, it, it, I've heard of other men to talk about too, but um, I've only interviewed so many. Um, <clears throat> one of the testes would often pop inside of my body during sexual activity. And that's and when that happens, it's like, okay, I got to stop and relax things and um, wait so I can pull, push that out. Then I have to try to keep my breathing and everything under control so I don't get engorged again too much but you know, if, you know I can still finish yeah. and then you have the pelvic floor which is the other side right that's the, where the stomach meets the stomach area meets the, the penis so when the penis is going out like this right um, instead of going out straight like it's supposed to by uh, unfolding the prep use it's being bent it's acting like a crane or, you know, like they look at the back of a tow truck and you can see those cables that, you know, lift up the arm of the tow truck, right? So right. penis starts doing the same thing. And that's not absolutely horrible until you start having sex with someone that is expecting to be able to have different positions where the penis is supposed to be straight and more flexible and all that. Um, so if you've got a a bit of a curve. I, I often compare this to like those balloons that um, you fold into animals or flowers and all that. Um, if you take one of those balloons after it's blown up and you bend it, it, it kinks, right? Mm -hmm. This is filled up with blood. Your corpus cavernosum is filled up with blood, but it's in air, but it's even stiffer. It's not supposed to bend very much. In fact, there's cases where um, men have. Um, injuries, internal injuries, where the corpus cavernosum breaks and you have internal bleeding on that. But uh, if the partner starts doing this, then you don't have just one kink, you end up having two. You can see by, by that. 
And uh, for me, when that would happen, it's like, okay, get that. <laughs> can't go that far. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then one of the side effects that uh, occur a certain percentage of the time, um, it sounds like a third. I, I've heard some various numbers, but it's, it's far more often than I think people realize and is regularly published. Brian Earp shared a tweet um, not too long ago about this. And yeah, it happens a lot. It's called meatal stenosis. And that's where the the um, the meatus, the part right at the end of the, you know where the urine comes out, uh, the end of the urinary tract, uh, closes up. Stenosis, right? Mm-hmm. And some men, and uh, I've heard this many times, it, it's more than just stenosis. It's also like things growing across. Um, for me, I actually had a little bit of a skin piece of skin, very tiny, but. Um, that jumped across somehow, and um, I my urine would kind of fly into you know multiple positions. Well, I would urinate when I was seven, eight years old. Something like that. I I was old enough to have a vivid memory of this, but um, yeah, I was still a, a boy, and my I vividly remember my grandmother you know getting irritated with me making a mess, and she took me to the doctor and had the doctor look at me and was like, oh yeah, you got a little yeah okay you know just take a knife to it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's that insult to injury yeah yeah so i mean it didn't hurt because it's scar tissue so it's didn't have any nerves in it but yeah definitely memorable thing and we shouldn't have to be dealing with this sort of thing uh and i believe that there's i still have a certain level of stenosis um because i I've been living with it so long in my life. It's not like it's a horrible thing. I'm going to run into the hospital for it to get fixed, but I can feel a little bit of a sharpness to my, I'm urinating right there at the end. And then we have uh, skin bridges that occur, right? Because the intermucosa is attached to the glands, right? Uh, during ch- uh, early childhood, and it slowly separates as, you know, uh, the child gets into sexual behavior, and sometimes I've I've heard of cases. I've talked to one guy who he didn't start really separating until he was you know in his early twenties. Mm-hmm. Um, so the body expects the intermucosa to be attached to the glands. When you're circum- circumcising, you're sticking a probe down there, or whatever, or tearing it apart, separating it from the glands, right? And then they then they cut whether with whatever tool they're using to cut it off. But there's usually, you know, there's always a certain amount of intermucosa still left. And the body tries to heal itself, you know, um, the scar tissue, right? And, you know, the penis might be relaxed a little bit and just have a little bit of skin there. And if the caretaker doesn't make sure to thoroughly put Vaseline or whatever on the glands, um, what will happen is there'll be a reattachment and that creates a skin bridge. And then when you know the penis is down like this, you see this this well bridge that hops from the glands over the corona and down onto the mucosa. And there's guys that have to like reach in there with a Q tip and clean that out. Which is yeah. kind of the opposite of what we're doing this for in the first place. Hygiene, right? <laughs> That's not <Yeah>. hygienic. <laughs> <laughs> And all this sort of thing can lead to erectile dysfunction. Yes. Supposedly, uh, we saw far more Viagra in the United States than the highly circumcised United States than most other places in the world. Mm-hmm. I wonder why we're missing you know, a lot of our sensation there. Um, but erectile dysfunction is caused by two main things, right? You've got either got something physical wrong there or and or our biggest sexual organ of all our brain right mm-hmm. so if the guy is thinking oh my gosh this is you know horrible i'm missing something or whatever um or you know i wish i knew what it was like to have this rolling mechanism or have lubrication or um or things are drying out um and they shouldn't be um because when when you don't have well, i'm going to cover this in a little bit but when you don't have that 
coverage, and you start pulling the the lubrication out of the vagina, and it ends up drying out everything. So yeah. it's going to be hard. Oh, I mean, that's a turn off. It's going to be harder for the guy to um, keep an erection. Yeah, and it's a turn off, of course, too, when they're in the act and someone else witnesses their problem. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, which kind I of actually a... run into that with past partners, um, right. as has my mother as well, <laughs> dating an older men. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, the problem with circumcision, um, I, I once had a boyfriend, he was only 19 years old and already faced ED. Um, oh. and, and he was a Muslim. So mm-hmm. he, you know, he was circumcised at birth or seven days or however. Yeah. Um, and right off the bat, like, had ed already and that's so Uh, sad i've also witnessed it in 30 somethings um and that it seems awfully early to experience that but again a jewish man circumcised at birth yeah and you know at most semi-hard at any given point that's that lack of blood flow is so detrimental to the act of sex itself yeah it, sex isn't supposed to be a frustrating act no but it is more often than not in america yeah yeah uh, sorry that you have to deal with that i mean yeah again this is a you know this is affecting the partners too not just the people that are cut yeah absolutely i can only imagine um I, I'd, I'd love to get an interview or two or three with women that have been um, generally cut themselves mm-hmm. okay so then there's also um i i added this not too long ago premature ejaculation and someone made me think about this and it's like oh yeah well you know mother nature was really thinking this one through right mm-hmm. so where's the pendulum right it's in there right it's 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 covered up and that's that's the part that you know gets things going right and you get the ejaculation and mother nature wants you to impregnate the woman well you don't want to you know just be a just a little ways in to it, when you ejaculate you want to be all the way in right so when you look at how the penis works and we know that the finger is right up underneath here um, and we enter the, the vagina or whatever and things you know unroll here and then all of a sudden the frenulum is out there and then touching things. Beforehand, it's inside of its own casing and protected and not getting rubbed, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's getting unrolled. And then it's, then it's out there, put inside the vagina, and it's far enough in the vagina that it ejaculates into the uterus, right? Mm-hmm. You want to ejaculate there, not here. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, premature ejaculation. It's kind of funny because a lot of guys will say, you know, if I was more sensitive, I I I I wouldn't be able to last it long. It's like it doesn't work that way. It's not, it's not like the square inches on your penis become more sensitive. I mean, it it it's hard to explain, but um, I mean, it's kind of like cutting off a finger and say, oh, my hand is is not less sensitive. Well, your hand is still just as sensitive as it was without that finger. But with a finger, you have more hand, right? It's about um, quality versus quantity. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, some things will get um, less sensitive over time, like the glands is it keratinizes because it's out in the open. It's supposed to be covered. So, you know, there's a buildup of, of cells. I've heard this many times from guys that done rest- restoration. They start getting coverage again, and then things slough off, and then their glands becomes reignited, sensitive. So, yeah, so it's more complex than you know being less sensitive. It's yeah. <sighs> okay, um, and then there's general botches. Uh, many forms of general botches. Um, goes anywhere from you know the glands like i was saying earlier mugging clamp or other clamps or even the um, placibel 
I hear about stories where you know they didn't tie off the string on the plastic bell, right? And um, it slips off or whatever, and and crushes something, and something di- dies that's not supposed to die, or whatever, and then you end up having parts missing. Right. Um, and sometimes, well. It's, it's very easy, like when they're putting that clamp on there or the bell or whatever, if they don't put it on perfectly straight, they end up having, you know, two little skin on one side and end up having a curve, particularly during erections. Right. And then you have the absolute worst kinds of botches, and that's when the baby dies or a child dies um, because of blood loss or, or whatever. Um, yeah. It's unfortunately, the first time parents are learning about hemophilia in their child as it's nearly impossible to detect that in utero unless they're looking for it yeah I, I think there should be a rule that before any um uh, surgery on a child that unless it's you know dire emergency um you always check for hemophilia well it's a courtesy that's given to adults before any surgery is ever done yeah um, a full workup blood panel, everything. Um, they would never go in blind for a surgery for an adult, yet they do it to children every single day without any regard. And that makes no sense because they've never, yeah. they don't have a medical history. They have nothing to go off of. And that's yeah. totally unethical. Absolutely. I wonder why that is. I mean, why? Do... Because I think that they're worried that people would back out given the amount of time needed to make that decision. Most of the time, circumcisions are done almost in a backdoored way where the mother is under the influence of an epidural that hasn't worn off or some other trauma from her birth, because typically they're done in hospitals, which is already traumatic as it is. Um, And so they just they kind of take them before the mom really has a chance to think about it. And they don't they don't want to introduce something else that's going to make them think. Yeah, I think that was William Stoll's. law case where he he won a settlement because um the claim was that the mother was too drugged when she signed the 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 release form or whatever right. and right after she was you know after she was still drugged and everything like that and i could see that that could be a, another motivator too for um, the medical professionals um is that if they um if they drugged the mother and somehow the baby has some of those drugs in it too so it's like you know half out of it anyway so it's less likely the baby's gonna i don't know, squirm or scream or whatever um when they got um uh, they don't have to worry as much about um you know doing novocaine or whatever on the on the penis beforehand right. yeah uh, yeah I, I like to believe I like to give people the benefit of the doubt and, and trust that, you know, everyone is good at heart, but it's, that's a theory. I mean, I don't have anything solid to prove these medical professionals are yeah. you know, doing that sort of thing. Um, but yeah. yeah. So those of you that are watching this, um, if you're, you're going to have a baby or whatever, ask details. <laughs> Find, I should find a list somewhere of you know things to ask the medical professional about how they're going to do it. Are they going to use a mobile clamp, a comical clamp? How much of the frame are they going to cut away? And all these little details. And maybe even if they, if the parents were just to ask some of these details, those questions alone, just being seeing those questions alone, might turn them off to the whole idea. Period. I don't know. I would hope so, at least. One could hope. So that's all the physical aspects. Is there anything you think I might have missed? Um, not so far. Um, I think you've pretty much covered the basics on how it's done and the general effects. Of course, I think we're going to touch upon botched a little bit more, but you know. Yeah, well, yeah. If you have any botches that I might have missed. Um, um, yeah. Well, the one from my personal experience. Um, I had a boyfriend who, um, you know, he loved his circumcision. Um, However, I I called his bluff because he would bleed during sex. Um, He would rip his circumcision 
almost every single time to some greater or lesser degree. Oh my God. Because he had what they considered a perfect high and tight circumcision. Uh huh. Um, and being, you know, unfortunately, like because of the way that they did that to him, mm. um, there was nothing left to for any give during intercourse. He got the short end of the stick, so to speak. Um, <laughs> they took Goodbye. everything and, and they did what you talked about where they dug out the frenulum as well. So he had, oh, man. you know, and, oh. and on top of that, there's also a bit more about what you're talking about. Um, premature ejaculation and not knowing when you're going to ejaculate. I hear this a lot about people who have accidental pregnancies. Yeah. Um, Nine times out of time, nine times out of ten, I find that the husband is circumcised and literally cannot tell when he's about to ejaculate. It yeah. just happens and there's no time to pull out. And if you're doing the pull out method with a circumcised man, don't because yeah. they cannot tell at all or very little sensation to give, you know, yeah. a little forewarning. Whereas with intact natural men, I have found that pull out is almost entirely effective. Mm -hmm. um, I I have never had an oopsie with an intact man, wow. never. Um, but a big difference with circumcised men, there have been oopsies, and yeah. you know, you know, one the, you know the one of the reasons that they use is you know reduction of STIs, but. <laughs> I, the problem is, one of the problems is, is you're taking away all the sensitive skin. So that's even more reason for a man to not want to use a condom because mm -hmm. he's not feeling a whole lot in the first place. So you want him to feel it even less. Uh, you know, so he's going to, yeah. so an intact man is more likely to be okay with wearing a condom. I, I don't know. At least that's my theory. I'm not intact. So <laughs> I have a whole group on Facebook called Intact Male Intactivists. And uh, I've, asked um, many questions from them and even had other people ask me to ask the questions and we hear only from intact men uh, about these myths and everything like that and, and they they go they peel them away and debunk the myths and all that so yeah so. okay well thanks for sharing that uh, it's Oh man, I feel sorry for that guy. Oh, I do too. Oh, man, yeah, I have I have a high anti, and you know, there's this thing called coverage index, and you know, the idea is that you, know, you look at how much of your glands is covered when when things are relaxed, and it's like I basically a zero, zero to one, somewhere in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So imagine he was <laughs> he was a negative one. <laughs> Yeah, that was uh and and the thing is too is that he didn't even know that his circumcision was bosh. I pointed it out to him. Um yeah. and it's not that I was his first or something crazy like that. It's just yeah. nobody had ever thought to tell him that something was wrong. And you know, he was very taken aback and even a little offended. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, it's our manhood, that, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's and, part of our ego. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and it's very hard to tell someone that they've been damaged by something that they had never occurred to them was really a problem because that's something they've lived with their whole life. Mm -hmm. and so I, think, I, I don't know if I ever changed his mind about his thoughts on it, but mm, I'm sure you did. I hope I hope I planted a seed for him because absolutely, I can't imagine living a life with that forever. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I was 35 when I was when I first started looking at this and my first son was born and it took me years to process all of this information, all those, all those things I listed off. I did not learn all at once. I did not. Um, there was, I, I still don't think there's a single source out there that, that listed all off in complete detail like that for yeah. people. Um, in fact, I'm thinking I might reach out to the, um, Doctors was not circumcision guys and say, hey, can we add this to the website or whatever? Uh, maybe. Uh, it, it would have been nice in some ways to just learn it all at one time and just get it over with. But it's like I learned one thing and then I go into, you know, the five steps of um, grief and all that. <laughs> Get back out and learn another thing and over and over and over again. 
Um, so okay. yeah, it took me a, like a dozen years to come out on this. So yeah, and and I mean, if you are in the dark, imagine how in the dark all these women are having oh, yeah. babies. Yeah. And I mean, legally speaking, and from a medical standpoint, doctors are expected to give a full and complete list of side effects or <laughs> risks before any surgery or any drug prescribed or anything before they can carry it out. Yet they just come in and go, okay, we're taking your baby. Yeah. And they never tell the mother there's a risk of death. There's a risk of bleeding. There's a risk of buried penis there's a risk of this or that they're like in the dark completely mm-hmm. and that's i find that terribly unethical yeah yeah um my wife uh, her ob asked the question almost as a in, in a way that's like well yeah of course <laughs> yeah <laughs> like yeah you should get that done or whatever it's he he my wife kind of responded like that well shouldn't i and you know with a, with a question mark and he not for no information, zero, so it's not. A, and that just, whenever I think about how my son could have gotten cut um, because of that lack of information, I just want to go strangle the guys. <laughs> like, yeah. at least I go, he still works at the hospital. He's actually chief medical officer now at that hospital. And it's like, if I was there, I would, if I was close enough, I'd be protesting in front of it every day if I could. Yeah. So, um, yeah these medical professionals need to wake up to the harms and let people know that there are harms. So, mm-hmm. Until then, it's up to us uh, general to autonomy advocates, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I hope it's not as few of us now in yeah. the near future. Yeah. Um, did you by chance pass on that to, to that uh, that Muslim boyfriend? Um, like restoration or anything like that and talk to him about that at all um no unfortunately um i haven't been in contact with him for many years but okay. hey if you're yeah. watching this <laughs> <laughs> pass on norm.org or talk a little bit about the tlc tugger or something like that yeah pass on right that. yeah norm.org is national organization of restoring men if you don't know that okay so all these physical issues uh you were kind of already talking a little bit about it uh it leads to challenges with sex sexual activities with a partner mm-hmm. the first part is heterosexual activities right penis to vagina and uh and unless you're really really good at getting that wap on getting everything moist and everything beforehand and you're not in a rush or you're not looking for a quickie or whatever um that rolling mechanism and that moisture, that lubrication um, comes in handy because you, mm-hmm. know, you can just get started almost right away with uh, no friction, right? I went that far without having to slide anything through my fingers, right? It unrolled, right, that far. Mm-hmm. So, and then you know, as long as, you know, the man has some slack or whatever, again, different men have different amounts of prep use left over, that, Going back and forth from there, again, it continues to be necessary without lubrication. It also manages to keep the lubrication inside the vagina instead of dragging it out every time the penis goes out and in, out and in, out. Mm-hmm. It's drying out. Go back in, get some more, <laughs> bring it out, try it out some more. Um, females aren't designed, the vagina is not designed to generate lubrication that fast. It's true. And it, it even has. Um... I don't want to say teeth, but like kind of ridges inside the vagina deep within um, about the length of a penis. Um, exactly. And it's, it's intended to grab and pull the foreskin to keep, you know, keep you guys connected to, yeah. to help to stimulate the man as well. Exactly. And the female G spot is also very, you know, interconnected with that as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just going to be totally blunt and honest. I've never Please. had a vaginal orgasm with a circumcised man ever, but with intact men, absolutely. And it's yeah. easy. And so many women don't know that. Um, and they won't even give it a try. And I'm like, but why? Yeah. Well, because it's like an alien to them. Yeah. You know, they've seen this all the time, all their lives. Then to see something like this, it's like, 
ew. You know, it's like seeing an alien from outer space. It's like, I want to touch that with a dead red bull. It's like, don't knock it before you try it. <laughs> no, I, I'm always telling them, like, give it a try before you say no. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> so sad. It is. And then, and then to project that on their children too, because they don't oh. like the way it looks. Yeah. So they don't want any other woman to see it that way. Mm-hmm. Some, some yeah. fictional 20 years in the future, provided that their kid survives that long. Yeah. For one yeah. thing. Um, yeah. And provided that that's how they want things. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you want to be in your, in your child's bedroom for the rest of his life. Right. You're going to walk <laughs> in the closet. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. Well, <laughs> You know, you talk about the ridges and everything. It, you know, the vagina, it's got the mobile skin in it too, just like the penis is supposed to have the mobile skin. And it's really important. That whenever, quite often I hear about FGM victims having troubles with birth and all that. Well, it makes sense. You you cut away all that labia. The you know, There's like two parts of labia, right? And they mm-hmm. carve that away to make a, you know, I don't know why they call it cute or think of it. Cute, it's, oh, it just grosses me out. But um, <laughs> it, it's like, okay, how is this hole supposed to spread out to 10 centimeters or whatever it is for the baby's head when you've carved away all that skin? Not to mention <laughs> the scar tissue, which is inflexible. Yeah. It's like, so it goes both ways. I mean, yeah, the man isn't going to be, you know, isn't going to ha- have birth. So, yeah, that's a serious, yeah. you know, it definitely for the female is a more serious thing but yeah the flexible skin is supposed to be there for a reason so leave it there everyone yep okay got my soapbox over here (laughs) any other thoughts on heterosexual sex and the effects um well yeah and from the female standpoint um from male and female um it's just a lot, it's a lot more painful to be with a circumcised man for a lot of different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, for one thing, it requires a lot more foreplay to get the, the necessary amount of lubrication. And that's exactly. given that you can get to that point. Yeah. Um, and then to add to that, that shovel shaped head, that mushroom shaped head of their penis that has like you know, it has a base to it and that just scoops out the all corona. of that fluid that you work so hard to build up. Yeah, the coronal and then, and then before you know it, you're just dry as bone again. And then, you know, you're depending on lubricants and, you know, it it's painful. It is like rug burn inside your vagina. Yeah, so it's pretty excruciating for a woman um, when there's just so much friction and often they can't even tell they're hurting you. Um, and it's also, it kind of ruins your sexual communication too, because if you're constantly saying, "ow, this hurts, then they're getting turned off because they feel like they're harming you. Yeah. Um, and that sort of thing. Whereas with intact men, I find that foreplay is very short rug burn, which mm-hmm. is, and, and even bleeding after sex is common for women as well. And some blame it on um, their cervix or something like that. And often it's actually just trauma inside the vagina from yeah. so much friction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I've had cases where, you know, I get into too much of a rush or whatever. And I, I actually have this video on, on my channel. Uh, you might want to look it up sometime. Um, but it's like, I, I just showed people, you know, you try to stick your finger inside your fist. It's not very easy. You start feeling the, the drag right away. Right. Um, but then I took a part of you know, a finger from a rubber glove and I stuck a little tape on the end of my finger in order to, to you know, act like the glands. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I put the, the finger part on the glove or the, on my finger. And uh, then, I, um, well, then, you know, can't put that in, right? But then put a little, just a little bit of Vaseline on the end to represent the lubrication that would be there from the intermucosa and then pull the glove back up so it, um, overlaps a lot like the prep use does right doubles up and then try to stick it inside your finger and it's like it's like you can tell it's really easy this is something that anyone can try at home <laughs> right it's safe <laughs> <laughs> safe to try at home so yeah it's like that if that doesn't tell you how different things are i, I don't know what 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So uh, when I was, I guess what I was saying is that I, I, I wouldn't wait until things were wet enough or whatever, and I would tear my partner. So bleeding. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's not good. I mean, any kind of tears or rips or whatever. And yeah, the the mucosal skin is is definitely more sensitive. It's it's thinner than a lot of our other skin, so it makes sense that it tears a little easier. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, and then similar sort of thing with anal sex, you know, with anal sex, you have, you have no lubrication, right? Um, so if the banal has, is prep use, um, you have the lubrication in there as well as the rolling mechanism. So you can actually do anal sex far more comfortably when you have the prep use in place. And then this doesn't apply to you, but, um, for homosexuals, gay men, Mm-hmm. Um, having the prep use, especially you know, amongst gay men that know the difference, having the prep use is highly valuable, highly sought after, especially in highly cut cultures. Um, it's like men will be on the hunt for men that are intact. I actually have uh, some friends where um, one partner is intact and the other partner is cut, and he's just straight up. Before I think even before he realized I was a serious intactivist, he said, "Yeah, it's, it's just a relation. It's you know." <laughs> um, and then I started talking to him more about it, and he found out he realized that I'm an, an you know advocate for general tatami. He, he started pouring out with a lot of other information, which is really um, a big thing for this guy because he uh, he has anxiety with um, what do you call it social anxiety, so. The fact that he was able to be comfortable and tell me about all the details was was really great. But yeah, gay couple that one's intact, the other was not, and the guy that's cut is extremely angry. So. Yeah, I, I honestly think that um, a lot of people don't think about that factor. Um, a lot of the time, you're seeing heterosexual men defending their circumcised penises. Um, but I almost never see gay men defending it because I think that they know how important it is. Mm -hmm. Um, I even know a a bisexual man who was in a gay relationship for many years and he didn't cut either of his sons later on down the line when he had children, because he, he understands the validity of having that organ based on his own experience. It's not just for heterosexual men. Yeah, I'm always seeking to connect with intact, or with cut men with intact sons, because that's what I am. I'm I'm a cut man with two teenage intact sons. So mm-hmm. I have a group on Facebook called um, "Cut or Circumcised Cut Men with Intact Sons." So hundred some members in it. So yeah, it's great to great to get to know other other guys that ended the the chain. Yeah. So that's all the effects um, with sexual partnerships. Uh, then there's the psychological effects of all this, right? And, uh, and people will hotly debate this one, but um, there's trauma from the cut. There's trauma um, from the child being cut. Whether the, the baby remembers it when they get older or um, whether the baby didn't feel anything because it was well drugged or whatever, um, I'm pretty sure there's trauma one way or another. Absolutely. It's a well-documented fact that um, cellular structures remember physical trauma and oftentimes can even pass that trauma genetically to their children. And that's, it's documented science. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, limbic memory is one of the things I often hear of is like, okay, well, you know, if you had a, a hand or arm or leg or whatever cut off, your brain still kind of expects it to be there. Right. Uh, so sometimes people have, you know, these thoughts that, you know, like a ghost leg or whatever is there. It's, I know I, I get that as, you know, not as big as a whole limb, but, you know, the brain is still probably still expecting it to be there. Maybe it's adjusted some, but um, yeah. And then there's uh, trauma from the discovery of the, of the loss harm as uh, personally, I, I didn't start discovering it until I was in my late thirties, but I was traumatized as I learned about this. And I think that even um, women 
like you um, are traumatized from, is, you know, especially if you're involved in a relationship with someone that you really, really love and you really, really want to be with them, but you start realizing that this partner of yours doesn't have all of his parts and how that affects you know your relationship with them, that's got to be traumatizing. Right? Definitely. It's, um, it's a really hard conversation to have with a partner um, considering it's their pride and joy. Um, yes. Either tell them that they're hurting you or to try to get them to step away from the cognitive dissonance that they've developed over the years mm -hmm. in order to live with what happened to them. Yeah. Um, the indoctrination. So yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, everything on the media is pro circumcision for the most part. It's, you know, you watch a movie and they're making fun of intact men in Europe. Um, and I think um, it leads to a lot of the defense that they feel that they need to display um, because they feel like the world isn't going to accept that they have a traumatic experience associated with it because it's the best kind of penis to have or something like that. Um, and, and so it's really, really hard to cut through that to get them to realize that something was done to them, even if they're experiencing harm from it. Um, like the case of my ex who tore during intercourse. Yeah. Um, he had never really thought that his circumcision was a problem, even though this clearly was a problem. It had to be pointed out to him for him to start taking that in. Um, but it's, it's very hard to be in a relationship with someone, um, yeah. and not be able to really like look at them without feeling some sympathy. Yeah. Um, and they don't want that sympathy either. Um, they don't men want don't want them and yeah. be like, I feel really bad that you were hurt. Cause they're like, this is my, this is my goods. Like you're not proud of it. It's, it's so it's really difficult. Yeah, uh, and you know the first step of uh, of of, trauma, uh, of um, grief is is denial, right? So, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's denial in the biggest way too because it's it's the most important. You know, <laughs> do a lot of men. It's the most important body part. <laughs> Okay, so and all yeah, all this you know all this trauma from you know not only you know being cut you know as a baby but then discovering it and realizing all these things that we're missing out on all that sometimes leads to suicide um, as, yeah I've heard of the suicides that have happened yeah. in recent years yeah like Jonathan Conte Alex Hardy uh, David Raymer but I mean his case was extreme um and i've done two interviews with um two people that were connected to um some suicides lately so i think that we've only begun to see uh, suicides unfortunately and it it scares me it it actually you know it, it in some ways it scares me from wanting to do advocacy work but i kind of have to weigh the two it's like okay well we've got uh, adult men that have sensitive feelings um and it, explaining this and, and telling people about how it's harmful might send them to that place. But we also have children being born today and I want to protect them so they don't get cut and that this doesn't continue forward. So. Right. And of course, um, as we raise awareness, I hope that we'll have a better mental health system that caters to these men and I agree with you. Um, there's definitely a certain amount of risk with activism in this particular subject, um, because the more people we make aware, the more people that who already may be struggling with their mental health may be facing suicide or self-harm due to it. As I think anybody would, if they realize that something was taken away from them without their consent, I think it's, it's very much like rape in that way. Mm -hmm. um, that they, there was nothing that they could do. They were tied down and something very painful happened to them, that took away sexual pleasure. Um, but I also hope that with awareness and with speaking out and with activism, 
the need will grow for better mental health systems to be put into place for these men to go to rather than resorting to self-harm. Yeah. Yeah. I think we need uh, mental health professionals to well, be professional and see that this is harm. So when a guy comes in and starts complaining, <laughs> they don't, uh, they don't shrug them off or ignore them or, or mock them or anything like that. You know, it's like actually hear that. Yeah. They are harmed. So, Absolutely. Um, I don't have you, um, have you seen this book? He he actually yeah. talks about his his uh, journey um, where he was trying to restore and and how he met with psychologists and and urologists and, and all these people that like race him out of the office stuff like that. <laughs> you know, so yeah, he he wasn't uh, he wasn't listened to mm-hmm. and uh, wasn't empathized with or, or sympathized with. So yeah, yeah, and. For children, um, I've heard a lot of the time when you take a child in for, for instance, an ear infection, um, especially chronic, um, or even hearing difficulties when they go and get their hearing tests done, um, often they'll be asked, is the child circumcised? Yeah. Um, Uh, Good. And then that's so that they can, you didn't catch that part? No, I I did. That's a good, that's a good point. I, I, I totally forgot to include those in future and in other interviews is that um, hearing um, sometimes gets messed up because they scream so fucking loud they bust their own hearing. Exactly. Uh, yeah. um, and, and so I think that that should be a question that's asked when men go in for mental health checkups as well. Um, not in a way that's mocking, of course, but in a way to detect that there could be something underlying, just like with children, um, even for autism testing and um, occupational therapy for speech delays and things like that. I think that this should be a subject that's brought up if it is not already. Um, Because who knows how much of this is due to the psychological trauma, you know, their voice not being heard at a day old, screaming their lungs out when you wonder why they're not talking. (laughs) Exactly. So he actually went from uh, the suicide to the children part of psychological um, impacts here. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, this definitely affects children. Uh, I, I've interviewed some men that found out at age 15 or figured out at age you know, 14, 15, whatever, uh, you know, as they were going into puberty and uh, figuring this out. Unfortunately, our sex ed and, you know, yeah, school typically tell us much detail about this um and in fact i've heard of teachers saying oh it's, it's the same you know it's all the same you know regardless whether you're cut or not it's like baloney <laughs> it's not the same it's very different um and i think a lot of teachers don't even understand or realize the you know the differences so and then we have children too that aren't cut but um lately i've been using uh Greta Thunberg as an example because I read the story from her dad about how Greta went into uh into a depressive state after learning from school about the problems in the world with you know climate change and all that and until she went out and held a sign you know expressing her you know what she wanted to do or how, how she felt about it and um and ultimately that led to, you know, speaking out at the UN and uh, that's when she, she came to life, right? Um, you know, on one side, I feel sad that she had to go through that depressive state and all that. I feel sad that, you know, any children have to see this thing going on in the world that is barbaric. Honestly, when you really look at it, it's, it's still, it's barbaric. And, uh, you know, we've come, the world has come a long ways, but we still have this going on. And I've seen mm-hmm. plenty of videos where um, other you know, activists go out and take their children with them to their children hold science and all that and even talk about how they feel about it all. And I think about my own son to have seen me speak out and, and their mom um, and how they've seen people come up with really bad excuses for continuing the practice and i think they're just like shocked and stunned and 
disgusted and all that good you know, <laughs> lots of words i could probably come up with and um yeah. but they also join in and they've been joining in more and more they they like to go out protesting with me uh and even my oldest son he jumped on to a post one time um where someone was you know shaming me for you know having my kids out protesting this or whatever and my, my oldest son's like i'm very happy my dad is protesting so um so yeah it's it's yeah. good and bad <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but yeah there's clearly a psychological impact on them as well and then there's a psychological impact on medical Absolutely. professionals right <clears throat> uh, we have medical professionals in the movement uh, some that are regret medical professionals that used to do the cutting uh, christian northrop is uh, one uh, that's very vocal and very active on twitter and stuff like that and there's another one i'm yeah. forgetting her name but uh her her face was on a is on a poster that uh, sits on the back of the interaction um, van that runs around the billboard van or runs around I, I think it's in Boston or something like that over there. And uh, I, I couldn't imagine myself working in a hospital or clinic where they did this. I, I wouldn't be able to trust myself. I'd probably end up getting in trouble for kidnapping a child or something like that to try to protect them. Oh. Right. Um, you wouldn't happen to be in a medical professional, profession, would you? No, unfortunately. Um, I plan to go into it as a midwife at some point along the line. And of course, as an intactivist midwife, hopefully we'll change the minds, but yeah. not as of yet. Yeah. Uh, my wife is a trained doula and uh, she she went to, I guess, five births before she decided to do something different. But um, as she basically set her foot down and said, no, I, I can't be involved in any more births that, um, or you're going to insist on killing your child just can't yeah so. yeah it's it's very hard um being so involved and then watching them get hurt despite all of your efforts yeah um, yeah I, I it just boggles my mind sometimes when you, know, you provide all this information and they're still just they're gonna do it it's like they have no no good excuse and they know they don't have any good excuse but they're still gonna do it or i i have one friend um uh, it's like I'm gonna do it so he doesn't have to wear a condom to avoid HIV. Uh, did you not hear? <laughs> it doesn't stop it's HIV. Sounding, it it doesn't sound logical, and you think that after saying that out loud, that would sound illogical to them, but it it doesn't even occur to them. I don't know. But but I do find with these um, pediatricians. In particular, there was one um, here in Florida. I'm not going to mention her name, of course, but um, she was actually my son's first pediatrician. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we went to her her practice, I didn't know that she performs circumcisions at her practice. Um, yeah. I thought that she was a very natural minded, holistic pr practitioner. Um, and it turns out she wasn't. She, she had a room back there with a board and she would just do them right there. And I had no idea. Um, I, I actually only found out later after I had fired her. Um, but she, she asked us if we were circumcising and I told her, no, I'm like, absolutely not. I would never do that. And she's like, oh yeah, they're totally unnecessary. Yet she yes. was performing them every single day. And that confounds me. You know that it isn't necessary, but you keep doing it. I can't help but believe that's for money. There's no reason to do something so awful unless no. there's financial, you know, inspiration. I guess. Well, I've heard of some people say that they do it because um, if, if it's going to be done anyways, it's better to do it in a, by a professional in a safe environment, all that stuff. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, this is isn't a problem to find another person who will do it typically. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, this similar thing has been going on with FGM lately about medicalizing female circumcision because yeah, at least it's done in a hospital or it's safer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> right. Just, you know, stick the boot up a little further so we can taste it. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said. <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's psychological effects on medical professionals for sure. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, you can watch lots of videos from medical professionals that are involved and they talk about their hatred for the practice and all that and how it's hard for them to continue to be nurses or doctors, which we need. We need more nurses and doctors um, to help keep cost of medicine down and all that and, mm-hmm. and help keep people alive and um, and deal with this COVID problem. And <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we definitely don't need more barriers to them becoming good medical professionals. Absolutely. I, um, we recently did a, a bunch of us in Tatavis reached out to a hospital and asked, um, not a hospital, but a, a, a university that taught people uh, to become medical professionals. You know, is it a requirement that you do or witness one of these in order to get your your degree? And they, they said no. So, yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, uh, I, did, I did find out that a Catholic hospital, um, Providence, up in Olympia, Washington, they they don't do these so yeah i've heard it's very traumatic for most nurses um having to witness or assist in them before they can get their degrees um there's many intactivist nurses who you know put their hands up after the first time they witnessed one because it was so grotesque they couldn't ever condone it again yeah it's it's hard yeah for them. yeah I, I understand that a lot of medical professionals, they, they learn to switch off the empathy part of their body or their brain. And I understand that because it helps them focus on getting the job done, right? especially surgeons. Yeah. But uh, it's not good when it comes to, you know, this particular issue. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then there's a psychological effects on parents. Um, I'm a dad that came that close to letting his son get cut and uh, the just imagining that things would be different right now uh, just makes me absolutely sick um, and angry absolutely so uh, we have several regret parents in the movement uh, mm-hmm. one rest in peace uh, rosemary romberg she was very active wrote a book and put together a website and stuff like that on the topic Right. Uh, I think that even parents that aren't regretful, they I think they're probably psychologically affected even one way or another. I mean, maybe maybe a part of them felt bad, but then they closed that part off in their brain. <laughs> um, or they, uh, they get confronted by uh, their child when they get old enough to f- understand what's wrong and complain. I even I interviewed one guy, a cut at five years old, and uh, I guess he told his mommy, um, "Put it back, mommy. I want it back." <laughs> Can you imagine having your child say something like that? Mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah. It's I can't even imagine. But yeah, it, it even again, like you said, um, for those who came terribly close, um, just the idea of coming so near to making that mistake it's like a near miss getting hit by a bus yeah um the a few of my dear friends um i was directly responsible for saving their children from circumcision Um, (laughs) thank you um but of course he's a he's a circumcised man and he never saw any problem with it he didn't really have enough issue with his own goods to have yeah. any qualms about circumcision until I reached out directly and said, please look at all this information. Um, please like research the functions before you decide to do this. Uh, I know that you want to be the best parent you possibly can. And three years later, um, and, and I knew that he hadn't circumcised because of me, but three years later, um, he reached out to me and he said, I want you to know that um, just because I refused to look at information back then um, because I didn't want to know what had happened to me doesn't mean that I didn't find out now. And I'm very, very angry at what happened to me. And it's only because of you that I know this now. Yeah. And I just want to say that even though, 
<laughs> I it seemed ungrateful um, back then. I'm so grateful that you saved my children because I would have made the wrong choice if it hadn't been for you. Um, and I had another uh, with a similar story too. He just went, you know, we thought it was going to be easier just to do what I knew because th- this man had only had a daughter and then he had a son many, many years later. And as a circumcised man, he'd never thought twice that, you know, this is what they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to look like. And I know how to teach a son how to use and pee with a circumcised penis. Yeah. Um, and they had no clue how to take care of an intact boy. So I taught them how, and awesome. they ended up not circumcising due to that because they just, they had that little bit of information that they needed to feel safe in it. Yeah. Um, and then again, he came to me many, many months later and thanked me profusely because he had researched later on mm-hmm. and came to that same conclusion that he'd come so close and missed it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kira. That's it warms my heart every time I hear stories or see or you know see other genital autonomy advocates uh, speak out to protect children. Yeah. yeah, and of course it comes with its losses too. Um, those we don't save, and those are just <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I, the book makes it worth it. I compare it. I, I, I know. I know this is the kind of thing that leads us to burn out and all that because it, it's really disheartening when we don't succeed. Absolutely. Um, however, you kind of have to look at it like a sales job. You know, you, you might make 10 calls and might only get one lead. That's the reality of it. But um, that one makes it all worth it. Definitely. And you don't have any idea, you know, what might go forward with those other nine down the road. Um, or they, you know, it might stick in their head on down the road and they'll finally think, well, maybe I should research this or whatever. Or they heard from you and they saw bloodstained men out protesting or caught by out protesting or um, the intaction billboard running around or whatever. Mm-hmm. Something else adds up and it finally kicks in. It's like, well, maybe this is really an issue. Maybe I should think about it or whatever. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I was out protesting one day by the same pants outfit and um, this one car drives up and has to stop in front of me. And there's these three young girls, probably nine, 10, 11 years old. And they were looking at me and I mean, they just kind of stared for a while and we connected eyes and everything and didn't say anything. And uh, then the car went, but you know, I thought, you know, eight, nine, 10 years from now, they're probably gonna remember, right? Mm-hmm. And it's gonna make them think. Ah, uh, maybe we should research this <laughs> because there was this guy out here that complained. Maybe I should not cut my own son. So, right. It's kind of sad that to think that you know, eight, nine, ten years from now, that we'll still be this still still be going on in our world. But, no, well, we wouldn't give for it to be done tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want it done yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, it's it, uh, at this moment in time, it's up to us advocates to to share the information because the medical professionals aren't doing aren't doing it, or or our schools aren't doing it either. Parents aren't doing it either. Um, to be fair, I think that yeah. sexual education is far too much of a faux pas um, in the household, and it's absolutely it's fairly problematic as far as this goes um yeah even um someone in my family um cut both of her sons and she has five brothers who are intact Mm. and her mother did not teach her the vital importance of intact men and it led her to doing her own research which Mm -hmm was unfortunately extremely PR for yeah. circumcision and with the pressure of her husband on top of that, it caved her in to yeah. do that. And that's why we have to have sexual education in the household too. Yeah. Yeah. Probably went out to Google and did a search for circumcision benefits. <laughs> yes. And of course you'll find them. Yeah. It's like you'll find the benefit of anything. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They're not going to 
<laughs> I'm not going to give you the the other side of it or this other you know the whole discussion. I'm just going to give you the benefits. Certainly. Yeah, it's that. Hopefully, we'll change that over time too. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's the psychological effects on the parent, and then we have the psychological effects on entitlement. And it sounds like you know some. Actually, it doesn't. I should I should really remove the word man honestly because. This applies uh, to, I'm sure, women um, in genital cutting cultures where they cut girl, women, girls as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I can only imagine being a, an intact woman in the culture where they widely cut um, girls and having all their labia and their clitoral hood and, and not having the husband stitch or whatever. Um, amongst all these others that are cut in one way or another and mm -hmm. having shame or or pity or whatever you want to call it um being in that situation uh, i've mm -hmm. big, i've spoken to plenty of intact men that you know so they you know they grew up feeling shame for being intact while their buddies weren't and or feel like they're maybe missing out on something because you know they all got cut well is there some sort of benefit that I'm missing out on or whatever when they don't understand um, that they're actually the ones that are better off? Absolutely. Um, actually happened recently um, in a, a Facebook group that I'm part of that is predominantly women. Mm -hmm. uh, someone posted about their significant other wanting to get a circumcision um, late in life. And she was just, you know, seeking advice as to what to say to him or whatnot. And she, you know, she goes on and goes, the sex is great. Um, everything's fine. There's no problems. He's just, a, he finds the aesthetic pleasing. Um, and he's been thinking about it for some time. And it, it was actually pretty stunning to see hundreds of women come in, um, in support of him staying intact, which I was awesome. very shocked at, I have to say. Okay. Um, but absolutely in a culture of genital cutting, um, a man who has it all, you know, wanted to go get a circumcision just because somebody probably talked about circumcision as looking nicer. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's it only looks nicer because that's what you're used to seeing. <laughs> right? Absolutely. And beauty is an eye of the beholder. Yes. I would much rather something functions than looks nice. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Not that intact uh, penises don't look nice. They just look different than, you know, what's in porn or what's on TV. Yeah. 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 And, yeah if you, you, if you learn to look at porn mm -hmm. carefully, you realize a, a lot more men are intact than you realize. <laughs> yes, it's true. Because once you pull it back, there's no visual difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. unless you're, unless you're really looking close and you're looking for that frenulum there and you're looking for the shiny, you know, smooth glands and stuff like that. Um, yeah. People like me that have been lucky enough can tell now. I can pick it out, you know, really easy. But uh, yeah, uh, you can always go look at the uh, German and Russian porn and see the real thing too. So, right, absolutely. And I mean, it's yeah, and it's and it's the same. I think, um, of course, there is an appeal to a retracted foreskin because that's uh, it's almost like a visual stimulus for yeah. sex, and of exactly. course, that's intriguing. <laughs> Um, and it is aesthetically pleasing, certainly. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, the rabbit shouldn't go back in the hole when it's done. <laughs> exactly. I mean, this, you go back to when they, um, they talk about when the rabbis decided to change this to be more drastic, to go from Brit um, Mila to Brit Priya. Um, they, the Jews, Jewish men, were ashamed for having their glands exposed at all when they're playing games with uh, the Greeks or Romans or whoever. Um, yeah, it's you're not supposed to look like you're ready for sex. <laughs> Are you all playing games, right? So. Okay, any other thoughts on uh, the psychological effects on anyone? Did I miss anything? Did you get that here? Um, yeah. yeah, and um, I don't know if we if this is one of the subjects too, but um, the psycho the psychological effects on women, um, about intactivism, mm -hmm. 
Um, like I think I think that there is a big psychological effect um, on people who are trying to fight against circumcision too. Um, just knowing what it is for one thing. Uh, anyone who has seen a video of circumcision, um, whether that be on a child or an adult, it's really traumatizing. Um, and then when you get to the stage where you're fighting against it, um, like as we were, we briefly talked about um, how I had fallen into a depressive episode due to my intactivism. Mm -hmm. Um, there was actually a period of time um, a few years back when I had to step away almost entirely from intactivism because the amount of um, information that was coming at me about, you know, people circumcising or um, seeing posts of people posting pictures of their babies before and afters proudly, like, yeah. um, or even just trying to get the point across to somebody who was thinking about it and then having so much backlash from other mothers who had already done it, therefore had to justify it by making other people do it um, and that sort of thing. Um, it really sent me down a rabbit hole. Um, and, and I ended up becoming so depressed in my personal life that I had to, I had to walk away. I had to mute all of my intact groups. I had to not look at it anymore, not talk about it to anybody. I, I didn't even talk about it in person to people anymore because I was so, it was affecting me so greatly yeah. um, that I just, I had to, I had to back off. Yeah. And that's another one too. Thanks it, for it has that. a massive effect on anyone fighting this fight. Yeah. Um, absolutely good point. Um, and you just made me add one more thing to the list of psychological effects because um, as much as I've been interviewing people that are burnt out, I've been burnt out into activists um, or advocates for general autonomy, um, it's in order to be advocates, we had to kind of reach, we had to go out there and look for an audience, right? And that process of looking for an audience, we might be searching for a circumcision or whatever and find posts where people are talking about you know, my baby's about to go through circumcision or uh, he was just circumcised and he's got all this pain and blah, 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 blah. And in order to do that, you, you end up seeing that stuff all the time. And, and like in the groups, we end up sharing posts like that and all that. And, um, and yes, you can only see so many of those after before just being so traumatized for so long as I, I, I kind of wonder how many, I, I'd like to, I, this would be really great to do, uh, study to find figure out statistics on how many of us have PTSD. <laughs> oh, I certainly do. Um, right. I, I mean, this is why I'm now a gentle intactivist actually. Um, because I think you start out and you're very riled up and you're really on yeah. fire and you just want to save as many kids as you possibly can, because you know, the trauma that this causes. Um, and so you start out and you're so angry that that just translates into everything you say, like after a minute of trying to like gently give words and then having someone, you know, immediately with the backlash of like, I'm going to do it no matter what you say. It's my kid. Mm -hmm. I can do what I want. Who are you to say anything about it? Um, yeah. And then immediately you go back and you're like, why are you being a bad parent or whatever? I, I see this a lot and I, I kind of cringe now, but, um, mm -hmm. but I mean, you can only see so many people getting, pissed off defending their right to cut and their right to give a surgery that's not necessary and they don't want to have their kid get bullied in the locker room and they don't want a oh, turtleneck yeah. dick or <sighs> they don't want to look at it they're the one that has to change the diaper every day i'm like you're crazy mm -hmm. a circumcision bingo as we call it sometimes we yeah, actually have some videos <laughs> <laughs> all the different excuses that people come up with it's like uh da, 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 yeah. Da. yeah bingo <laughs> you gave a few five in a row Absolutely. thanks a lot <laughs> they just they just tick down the list until they, they hit do. the one that makes you give up yeah yeah it's i often talk about the layers of cognitive dissonance it's not just one layer i mean when we were fighting against slavery and stuff like that it's like we pretty much just had to deal with one layer of cognitive dissonance right yeah it's absolutely um it can be a trigger um in fact sometimes i still get a little um anxious when i talk to somebody about the subject 
even in person because I'm expecting yelling or I'm expecting um, the immediate smackdown that's going to happen. And oftentimes that doesn't happen at all. Um, but I think these keyboard warriors have a lot more, you know, gumption behind a screen than they would in person. So yeah, yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's rough yeah, out there. I, I often, I welcome um, face-to-face <laughs> combat. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it on. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> It, it is very much, um, it's significantly easier to um, to talk about this in person, I think, because they can't just tune you out yeah. um, or hide behind their keyboard, you know? Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I've actually had some good conversations with, um, like, I, I called around one time, calling different clinics and hospitals and, and just telling them, you know, how upset I was that I'm cut and all that and, and I don't like it, whatever. I actually had one urologist call me back one time. Um, after hours, you know, in the evening and all that, and and uh, he, he got my phone number, doll, and and uh, he started off with the same old excuses that you and I are well, you know, used to, right? And I just dealt with each one of them, and he at the end, he's like, "Well, actually, you make a lot of good points." <laughs> so you yeah. know, it, it can't happen. And he, you know, he wasn't uh, reactive or whatever, but he, you know, he did, you know, go off with the normal you know, reasons why people do it and all that. And it's like, well, that's not a good enough reason. That's not a good enough reason. Here, here's, here's all the, you know, here's the problems with those reasons and all that. And yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's it's, it's good. <sighs> okay. So that's all the psychological effects, unless you have any other ideas. Uh, nope. That's all that comes to mind immediately. Okay. Of course, probably yeah. more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, you just go on about this forever, it seems. Um, relationships is the next major section. And it starts off with a child parent trust. And I think that that trust starts getting broken down pretty much as soon as you let your child away from you to go away and be cut. And first of all, the child is, I, I think children are supposed to be held skin to skin, preferably, um, be breastfed and all that. They're, mm-hmm. they're developed to ex- expect that. I mean, that's, that's what happens in the wild, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then when things start getting uncomfortable for them then they're crying whatever they're not being they're not being dealt with and taken care of and Mm -hmm. uh and then they something sort of feeling pain whatever they scream and cry and no one's doing anything to help them so their trust is getting broken down right away and then it can go further and um you know the child starts recognizing something's missing or whatever and start realizing the problems and all that and go to their parents and say hey why do you do this to me or whatever? And if the parent gets defensive, hmm, well, there's a different, definite uh, break of trust right there, right? Absolutely. So, and as a parent, uh, having my child's t- trust is is paramount. It's very, very important to me. Um, I want them to be able to confide in me, uh, not be afraid to do so, um, and know that they're going to get, um, you know, good information and all that and not um not be shamed to pieces and and all that stuff i i'm sure that i've made some mistakes in that arena but um yeah i i do everything i can to talk through things with them and all that Mm -hmm. and then there's the co-parenting aspect of this right Uh, i'm sure you've seen cases where you know people you know got into it one one parent wants to cut and one doesn't you know mm-hmm. we've been seeing this more and more on mainstream media you know with a uh, 90 day fiance and stuff like that oh yeah right yeah. <sighs> unexpected yeah yeah so um yeah some people getting divorces over it and uh and even you know i i've heard of cases where you know many years later there's still that anger that the bitterness towards the other partner because they gave in yeah absolutely. especially if you're a parent that goes on down the road and, and figures more and more out about how this is bad and the other person push you to allow it you are probably gonna even get more angry with your partner right absolutely <laughs> um like i was telling you about this uh family member mm-hmm. um it's exactly what happened with her um her husband had been circumcised at the ripe age of 10 
um, for goodness knows what reason, um, having to be circumcised so late, um, guaranteed probably due to forced retraction leading to many infections or scar tissue buildup, who knows. Um, but intact care is so unknown in America, it doesn't surprise yeah. me in the slightest. Um, or they just did it for looks because he's Korean and that's a, a very popular look in Korea. Um, mm-hmm. It's actually one of the major South, circumcision South countries. Yeah. South Korea. There. <laughs> um, and so anyway, so he ended up bullying her so, so hard um, that, you know, this is when she started doing her research to try to justify it because she goes, I'm not, I can't keep having this fight. And so I've got to, I've got to agree. Like, that's just the, the dad's the one with the penis. He's got to make the decision, I guess, even though I've got five intact brothers and none of them have had problems. Um, or if they have, they've been very minor and remedied with medicine. Um, and I mean, if I were in her shoes, I, I would feel a lot of resentment for my husband um, for bullying me, not once, but twice into doing something that she knew was wrong. She even told her family she knew it was wrong before she went through with it. Um, and then had to, in the end, beca- had to, because the husband um, probably held their marriage over her head for all I know. Um, he yeah. didn't want it to happen to his kids someday, but who knows if that would happen. What happened to him isn't a uniform thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to give a shout out to the Rigdons, uh, Jessica and James Rigdon, because they they've been brave enough to share their story about how they they had a hard time getting through this. Uh, luckily, they did keep their son safe, and uh, mm-hmm. and they're both very avid advocates uh, for general autonomy now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you can find their videos um, where they testify to the struggles that they went through on this so uh so thank you for the forced rejection thing i or not knowing intact care it's kind of an impact uh, is an effect of so many uh, men having been cut all this time that people have forgotten how to care for the intact penis unfortunately Um, i've heard so many medical professionals telling you know telling their parents the parents or whatever you know to to pull back to clean inside <laughs> that's absolutely yeah, wrong and that's harmful <laughs> that's another harm it with vaseline and <laughs> yeah i mean an intact penis you're not supposed to i'm sorry you're gonna you're gonna open up uh, the girl's vagina to break their hymen hymen and clean the inside of her vagina i mean come on it's right. very similar <clears throat> absolutely Okay, so that was co-parenting. Um, mother-child bond. Uh, this kind of relates back to the child-parent trust, but um, you know, there's bonding time, um, for, especially right after birth and all that, um, where your, your child connects to you. My, my wife actually gets a little, uh, she's a little mad because our first son, right after he was born, I held him for, the, uh, for a good while um, because she had to get stitched up a little bit. Uh, so I she thinks that he's bonded to me more than she is he is to her and uh, she blames that <laughs> as a reason so um there's you know there's lots of thoughts and theories and uh, papers i've seen um my wife was trained to be a doula and that was that's one of the things that comes up regularly is skin to skin contact right after birth and uh breastfeeding and all that stuff it, it's mm-hmm. all important so if you hand your baby off right. shortly after uh, that bond doesn't happen I'll right, not it. to mention that it compromises breastfeeding, which is extremely important for bonding. Yeah, yeah. You and I have probably read multiple articles and heard uh, how it interferes with breastfeeding a lot because you know, try try being in extreme pain and then eating. <laughs> if you've ever been in extreme yeah, pain, you probably yeah. weren't hungry because right? <laughs> you're, no, you're focusing it's, more it's on like the pain. Eating during childbirth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's if you have pain somewhere, you're probably not paying attention to the pain in your stomach. Thing that you're hungry. Absolutely. Yeah. If you get into a car accident, you're not thinking about your dinner. Yeah. Even Brother K talks about um, his story about when he was 
foreign. He he didn't eat for a couple of days afterwards because he was cut right away. So. Uh, and then there's right. um, there's the connection to pedophilia, and this isn't just about you know male genital cutting, but I'm sure you know here's here's a correlation that I make. You look at the um, the places where um, forced child marriages occur. As far as, I, as far as I know, it's only occurring in places where uh, genital cutting is going on, right? You don't hear about forced child uh, marriages Absolutely. in Russia or South America, China. Um, I, I guess China, they, they used to do um, foot binding, um, but I don't know, I don't know how young they, they got married, but still. Um, so to me that, you know, that's another form of yeah. pedophilia. That's an accepted form of pedophilia in those cultures. Um, but I, um, I've also heard of stories where nurses have reported that the butcher would get an erection during the procedure. But I, I have another theory too. I've heard of that well. If the guy is missing a lot of his very sensitive tissue, then what he's left with, I mean, that, you know, it's like, that's the miser corpuscles, right? The light touch stuff is missing out, right? So what they have left mostly is, mm -hmm. is um, pressure, pressure nerves, right? Mm -hmm. So it's believed, it seems that younger women, girls, teenagers, whatever, have tighter vaginas. I, I've even seen this in movies where they talk about, where women talk about doing their Kegels to make things tighter down there. Hello, oh, there's another reason for men to be attracted to, to young women. So, yeah, I mean, some people argue with me, it's like, oh, well, you know, older women can have tight vaginas too. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you're right, I don't know. Uh, this is just a theory. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I mean, sure they can. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, but you know, one of the I, I hear I've heard this multiple times from some doctors saying, you know, one of the growing surgeries that going on in the U.S. is women getting labiaplasty and, and you know reconstructive surgery down there to tighten things up. I was even on Sex in the City. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. Not right, something I would do, but hey, for an adult, that? they can make their own decision. Yeah. You know, it, but that's yeah, kind of the point. True, but you know, what's driving this? You know, I said, back. yeah, but I mean, at least, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the guys could be more satisfied if they had everything, and women would be more happy that their man is more interested in them if they had everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, then there's the doctor patient relationship yep. aspect of this. I personally couldn't have a doctor that, um, least of all performed this procedure uh, even supporting and or promoting this procedure i couldn't have him as a doctor um because yep. if, if they could break that that ethics rule there I and mean, what ethics are they going to violate when they deal with you know caring for me it's a little scary absolutely and i mean it's it's for one of the reasons that i um I've decided not to renew any pediatricians and just my son gets sick. I take him to urgent care because I know right. they don't and will not yeah. perform something like that at those places. Whereas my son's first pediatrician, lo and behold, right there in her clinic. Um, and I just find that it's, there is no trust if you don't, you know, if you think that they could cause that kind of harm, like iatrogenic harm is one of the leading causes of death. Mm. I wouldn't put my kid anywhere near that situation. Yeah. For sure. Right. And then the last uh, relationship is between friends, family, maybe even coworkers, right? If you decide to bring it up in <laughs> at work. Uh, that's probably the scariest I have. part. <laughs> it, have actually, it, has, it has destroyed a few relationships um, with coworkers. Wow. Um, some it's, it's strengthened because I've helped them see the light. Sure. But, um, with a few others, I, there were, it's so hard to get her to see 
that she had to do some research of some kind and she just, oh, you know, whatever. I have a whole nine months to think about this and then would just not acknowledge anything that I had said um, about it from that point forward. I'm like, you're so determined to do it that you don't even want to hear what I have to say. Um, and I ended up never speaking to her again because I couldn't, um, oh, I just couldn't even yeah. ask about her baby. I didn't want to know. Um, I know she had a son, so I just, I couldn't, it broke my heart. I was like, if she didn't listen, I don't want to know. I just, mm-hmm. I just want to be ignorant to the fact and I can't ask. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it was <laughs> sad actually. She was a very nice lady. But... Hmm. Yeah. yeah it... Kids. <laughs> Lots of relationships, friends and family, all lost here too. It's it's really sad, but um, again, I I'm putting the safety of children above that. Uh, one of the the thought that led me to coming out of the closet on this issue was that you know in 15, 16, 17, 18 years from now, chances are I might meet a man, a young man, that was cut today, and if he you know, if he says, well, you knew that was wrong, what were you doing, you know, when I was born? I'm going to at least be able to say I was speaking out, trying to stop this. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then there's, uh, that's all the relationship stuff. Then there's the FGM and intersex uh, general cutting or normalization surgeries that go on in the world and how this is all interrelated as far as far as i could tell from studying fgm didn't start before mgm started it's definitely and i i strongly believe that females started getting included in this to be equal to men or they, you know, the anti-FGM companies say, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's the other way around, but, um, you know, it's men controlling women. Well, mm-hmm. really, it's all about control. It's all about trying to control sex, right? Yeah. Reduce the so sexual urges so and all that stuff. Yeah. If I don't have it, you can't have it. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it could have come from both sides, right side. I, I even think that maybe the females were like, well, these men are getting closer to God because they're getting the genitals cut. Well, why can't we be included? Why can't we get closer to God? <laughs> I don't know. It's, that's a theory. I, and I, it's been happening for so many thousands of years. If I, I you... find out that that's true, <laughs> I'm going to be really mad. <laughs> uh, um. And, you know, with the intersex stuff, it's also about control. It's, you know, wanting wanting them, wanting your child to fit the binary, male, fully male or fully female, one way or the other. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, I, I think there's a strong right, belief which amongst... Which is honestly just ridiculous. Yeah. Like, yeah. And if they can pee, then, you know, that'd be... <laughs> um, so it seems to be really, a... a and, um... What's that? No, um, but also um, on the topic of intersex, um, I don't think the intersex is talked about enough for one thing. Um, I'm very passionate about this subject because it is so closely tied in with genital autonomy. Um, and it is so common of a procedure um, to um, you know, give them a sex change surgery at birth. Um, and and I'm, I've even seen videos of men. Um, there was a trans man, man who came out um, to his parents, and then they told him directly after that he had um, he'd had a you know gender change at birth yeah, because he I was born too. intersex, yep. and they decided that he looked more female, and yeah. so decided to just change it to be that. And he grew up not knowing if he was a lesbian or what was happening, but he's like, I feel like a man. And just to find out that he was a man as Mm -hmm. much as he was a woman. Yeah. And so when he went back to, um, you know, wanting to be a man, there was nothing left for him to have 
a sex surgery to correct it because if he if he had kept what part of his penis that he had been born with that foreskin or even the parts of what he had been born with could have been you know re-sculpted into a penis for him yep. Very um, important. a fully functional penis yep. but they took it yeah instead <laughs> Yeah, you know, having all that mucosal tissue would be very valuable for creating a decent vagina. How about that? <laughs> Absolutely. And yes. and there's so many nerves and those nerves can remain viable mm-hmm. um, even with reconstructive surgery. Yeah. And that's and that's the thing too is um, with society the way it is now with so many trans people coming out um, and so many people having the freedom to be trans but we're, we're severely limiting their ability to have a sex change in the future Mm -hmm. because you know, that tissue is the perfect tissue to create a modified vagina with because it's so full of nerve endings that they can actually have a vaginal orgasm if they were an intact male before they had their sex change. And so we're taking away so much more than just their heterosexual Right. And of course, um, with that, you know, if they're, if they were an intact male, for instance, um, leading up to their sex change surgery, that actually gives them the ability to have a vaginal orgasm as a female after reconstruction. Um, whereas they would be denied that altogether, um, and would even potentially have to have skin grafts or other things in order to help develop like the inside of the vagina, um, the vulva, all of that. So, you know, we're not just limiting their heterosexual sexuality where there's no way to know mm-hmm. what they want to be. So we're taking away all of it. Choice. Definitely taking away their choice. Choices. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I've heard of cases. I, I kind of wonder how many cases actually probably are going on out there where there's trans people that were probably actually modified you know, because intersex isn't as rare as people probably realize it's i heard that's like one in a thousand it's like that's really not that rare no and, it, and it's not even uncommon for a man to look like a man on the outside and have a pair of ovaries inside that he doesn't find out about until he gets abdominal surgery in his 30s you know it happens uh yeah there's one guy in nevada i think that uh has told me about that uh, well, actually he he found out that he, you know, he has a penis, but he also found out that he actually has a vulva, but it was just kind of closed up behind um, his skin. Yeah. yeah and, and there's no way to detect that visually yeah. uh, in a lot of cases. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. The whole intersex thing is, is that's a whole other topic. You just spend our days and days just yes. looking into because um, there's so many different scenarios that occur. Um, I'm part of a few intersex groups and, um, had I've had some even in person um, conversations about yeah. it. So. <sighs> okay, uh, and then the last thing is uh, about social productivity. Uh, what would these people be doing if they weren't cutting gen- children's genitals? Right, <laughs> <laughs> maybe curing cancer or something, or um, helping Don't feed fit. the world better. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's, and, uh, uh, what? I mean, I, I mean, we could take notes from Europe, for instance. It's not like those doctors don't have anything to do. Exactly. <laughs> Except, you know what I mean? It's not that hard to step away from something unethical, move toward something saner. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's just, it confounds me. Like, there are urologists in Europe that are doing just fine without correcting circumcisions on the daily. Yeah. They're doing fine. Oh yeah. I, I'm sure there's some here in the U S that would like to see an end to this too. So they can yeah. focus more on the, the regular, um, <laughs> yeah, urology issues. Effects, for instance, that yeah. Need repair, yeah. you know, it's not like we have a shortage of specialty issues. Yeah. Yeah. And then what if you and I didn't have to spend time trying to educate people, (laughs) trying to break through people's cognitive dissonance and all that stuff, you know, again, I was talking about the layers of of cognitive dissonance. It's not just one, but it's it's like 
four or five. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm cut. My, I cut my child. I'm, I'm a doctor who's been cutting children, or I work for doctors that have been cutting children, and uh, my religion believes in it. Or, <laughs> it's like, you had to oh, break through I, all those levels. Don't forget the nursing home argument. Oh, gosh, yeah. Because they don't know or don't care to take care of the elderly, which we already know is an epidemic problem here in the U.S. Um, elderly yeah. negligence is so yeah, bad. Don't yeah. ever walk into a hospice because you'll see they don't give a crap about our, our elderly. That's just a place for them to go die. So when you yeah. give the argument of they're getting all these infections, it's okay. As a nurse, what are you doing to prevent that? Yeah. Are you doing anything or are you just putting them through surgery so you guys can make more money from the government to keep your facilities open? Yeah. I, or just being lazy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of wonder if, you know, it, it, like there's a discomfort among the nurses to handle the penis. You know, maybe they're, maybe they're ooh, yeah, too grossed out or whatever. And they don't they're like, yeah. what did I do or how do I do this or whatever. It's like, I'm not used to an attack penis. So I don't know how to clean it. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm sorry, but if you know how to clean a bed sore, which you caused from not turning them, you yeah. can clean their penis. I mean, if you're in elderly care, that's, yeah. It's part of your requirements to get trained to do this, yeah. you know. And you know, I'd I'd much rather take the risk that that happens to me when I'm, you know, bedridden or whatever in my 80s or 90s. Yeah, and and life. enjoy yeah. most of my life having all my sexual parts intact. Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's hilarious to me that they're like oh well when I put them in a nursing home when they're whatever I'm like you're not going to be alive for that for one thing yeah. for another thing how do you know that they're not going to be a spry old dude in their 80s yeah yeah you don't yeah and this this might you know the chances of that happening are one in what you know a thousand right, right. or more um yeah. and okay while at the same time females are one one, one in eight chance of mm -hmm. getting breast cancer one in eight right. compared to one in like a thousand. Like, right, but we don't perform breast bud amputation at yeah, birth, even though that's an entirely logical prevention. It's just not ethical. Yeah, but what blocks people is they think they think that the foreskin has no value, that it's vestigial. It's like, yeah. oh, so it's not, it's completely different. Well, it's only completely different to you because you don't know what the value of the prep use is. In yeah, the first place. They, they don't even understand that it's made up of specialized cells, rural cells that are meant to form into, you know, a sphincter. They don't know that it's, it's specialty. It's only in a few areas of the body, yeah. like the mouth and the anus and other parts of the body that, you know, they, it serves a very specific purpose. Yep. I mean, other can you imagine if somebody cut off the end of our colon or something? It's better for you. You're not going to get colon cancer. It's the same thing. Uh, let's, let's cut off the toes. You know, uh, Bob Marley, he, he died from um, cancer because that started in his toes. Right. His, his parents should have preemptively amputated those, you know, so that wouldn't have ever happened. He, he doesn't need his toes. He could have he could have learned how to walk around without them. I mean, not as well. He probably wouldn't have been able to you know, be a super runner or whatever, but, you know. Right, and you can still hear without, you know, the extremities yeah. of your ears. Yeah. Does that mean we need to take them? Yeah. No. Okay, Kira. It's been a blast, even though we've had to fight this internet connection <laughs> yes, internet. over and over again. <laughs> yeah, likewise. But uh, I definitely appreciate you uh, coming on and interviewing with me and, and uh, helping spread the word. Yes, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Have a great day. You too.